too hot for a coat, we took the coat off, all right? All right. James chapter 5, please. James chapter 5. Weren't sure we really got it on patience. I think we needed a second dose. And if you say, hurry up and get this over with on patience, well then we need patience, don't we? So I want to look at it a little differently tonight, maybe a, a apply in what areas we need patience, all right? James 5 and uh, verse number 7. Notice, be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight, and as we open up your word and we look to study it again this evening, you would open our eyes that we could behold wondrous things out of your law. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would be the teacher. As Brother Yoder has prayed this evening, God, I know folks have had a long day. Some have had a very hot day. Lord, they're tired and they're weary, and uh, Lord, we'll need your help. We want to be uh, alive indeed under the things of God and dead indeed under the things of the world. And so, Lord, make our spirit alive tonight to your word and to the truths of your word and to this important quality and virtue of patience, that you would help us and, and, and apply the truth as we learn it tonight to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Patience. Well, we, we talked last week, this will be review a little bit, uh, about patience, the quality of enduring uh, enduring without murmuring or fretfulness, sustaining the afflictions of body or mind with fortitude, calmness, a Christian submission to the divine will. When you're patient, you're not easily provoked. You're calm when you have to suffer injuries or offenses. You're not vengeful. It's the ability to put up with people you'd like to put down. Spiritually, it's the ability to wait and let God do what He said He'd do. You have, we, we, we talked about uh, last week, you have to have faith and patience to inherit the promises. A lot of times we think, well, I didn't get the promise because I didn't have enough faith. No, you might have had just the right amount of faith. You didn't have patience to wait for it. A lot of times that's our issue. Is we, 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 we give God a deadline. And if God doesn't meet our deadline, then we're going to take things in our own matter. We're going to take things in our own hands. And we're going to do something about it. And, and patience is where we face the difficult situation and don't give God a deadline to remove it. We simply will wait on Him. So we looked last week at the explanation of patience. We looked at the examples of patience. We looked at the effects of patience. And tonight, I'm going to just be very practical with you and talk to you about when do I need to exercise patience. When do I need to exercise patience. I want you to turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 21. Would you look there, please? Proverbs, chapter 21. Right after the book of Psalms is the book of Proverbs. When do I need to exercise patience? Number one, you exercise patience when making a decision. When making a decision. Proverbs 21, verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but everyone that is hasty only to want. 
want in the sense of you'll lack, you'll lack what you need if, he, if you're hasty. In fact, the, the, thing that, the, the saying that most people are familiar with is haste makes waste. Okay, You know that it's not going to work. A hasty decision is usually a wrong decision. How many of you would admit there's times in your life you made a hasty decision that you regretted? Anybody been there? Yeah, if you're over 12, you've probably done that in your life, okay? And so it, it, it's happened. Uh, if a decision is the right decision, then the door to make that decision will still be open after you've waited. You know, the salesman that's at your house and wants to sell you something and says, you know, uh, after tonight when I walk out the door, then this offer won't be any good. Well, then the offer just isn't any good. Period. Because if it's not good enough for me to wait and to pray and to seek God about it, then it's not the right offer. Plain and simple. And so, uh, that, that's it. By the way, how many of you have ever been taken in by a salesman and you bought something that, that you didn't, and when he, when, once he left, you looked at it and said, what did I just do? Anybody do that? Yeah. No, the rest of you don't want to admit it, do you? <laughs> no, not me. There are good salesmen out there, you know. Talk you into things that you don't really want. Lot. Lot had a decision to make. Remember when Abraham came to him and said, there's strife between your herdsman and my herdsman? Uh, he said, Let's, you, you choose. I'm going to give you first choice. When you, when you go back and you look at that, the Bible simply says, Lot saw how well watered the plain was towards Sodom and how, how beautiful that was, and so he chose it. Uh, didn't say he waited. Didn't say he prayed. Didn't say he gave much thought to it. He just made a quick decision based on what he saw. How'd that, how'd that work out? Think he ever regretted that decision? You think Lot ever sat in Sodom when he saw his children living the way they were? When he saw the sin and, and wickedness that was there? Do you think when he left Sodom and his wife turned around and couldn't even put it behind her but had to look back? And God instantly turned her into a pillar of salt. Do you ever think Lot regretted his decision? i got to believe he did. If he vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation, the filthy living of the wicked, as the New Testament tells us, he had to have regretted his decision to move to Sodom. I, I would like to think he regretted his decision to leave Abraham because God blessed him while he was with Abraham. And so, learn to wait Learn to have patience when you're making a decision. When you, before you leave the job, have patience. Wait. Make sure. Before, before you leave a church, have patience. Wait. Make sure. Before you leave your service for God, wait. Make sure. What's that? Do you hear that? What fan is making the noise? This one? Huh? Is it this one? I'll live with it. <laughs> I want the fan on, amen? Uh, patience. Exercise patience. Accept the circumstances that God's put you in until God makes it clear what it is you are to do. Accept the circumstances God's put you in until God makes it clear what he wants you to do. All right, let me give you some questions. Uh, here's what you ask yourself when you're about to make a decision, all right? Um, you ask yourself, first of all, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about this? Remember, God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? Thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. You want prosperity? You want success? You have to know what the Bible says. You have to follow God's Word. So what does the Bible say? You say, well, and what if you're not sure what the Bible says? Then you go to number two. What do my spiritual authorities say about this? What do people who God's put in my life who know the Bible better than me what do they say about it? 
do they know Bible principles that I should follow that I'm not aware of? And so uh, God, God gives us spiritual authorities in our life. What do they say about it? Number, th number C, you ask yourself, how will this decision affect me spiritually? Paul said, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not what? Expedient. All things are not best for me. It may be okay, may be permissible, but is this going to help me or is this going to hurt me? Is this gonna, how's this going to affect me spiritually? Then you have to ask the, the one that follows up on that. D is, how will this affect my family? Is this going to bring my family closer to God? Or will this take my family further away from God? Remember years ago, had a, had a couple. Oh, I think they were in their 50s then. Might, might have been early 60s, but their children were grown. And, and they told me how, how much they regretted the decision. He had, he had gotten promotions at work, and, they had, and he'd gotten, of course, increase in pay that goes with the promotions. And he said, we bought ourselves a camper. And at first, you know, we'd uh, just camp Friday, Saturday, and then come back, and then pretty soon we started staying over. And we'd miss Sundays, camping. And we would do that many Sundays out of the summer. He said, you know what happened? Our kids got out of church. Now, they're past that. Their kids are grown, and guess what? Mom and dad are back in church, and mom and dad are faithful and want to serve God. You know what their biggest heartache is? They can't get their kids back in church. You know what they regret? They regret ever buying a camper. They regret ever investing in that and taking their family out of church. They didn't think, what will this do to my family? How will this affect them? Okay, and then at, uh, E, what are the risks involved? What are the risks involved with this decision? The Bible says in uh, Proverbs 27, verse number 12, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. You look ahead and see what the pitfalls could be with this decision. F, am I willing to let God shut the door? Remember in Acts 16, Paul wanted to go into Asia, but the Spirit said, no, don't go there. Am I willing to let God tell me no? Sometimes, sometimes God tells us no, and we, we just blow through every stop sign He gives us because we know what we want to do, <laughs> and we just tend to do it anyway. And then G, am I willing to step out in faith if God opens the door? If God gives me the green light, am I willing to do it? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In fact, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So whatever we do, we have to do by faith. What's faith? Trusting God. Taking God at His word. All right? So that's how we have patience when making a decision. Number two, and we use the same verse for this, is you have, you have patience when you're making a big purchase. When you're making a big purchase. You know, it's never been easier to be an impulse buyer than it is right now. Hmm? You know, I was listening the other day to a fellow on the radio. He said, you know, it's amazing. You can, you can sit in your favorite chair at your house. And you can, you can just say, I want this for dinner. And I want to order this for my kids for school, school clothes. And I want to uh, order, purchase this. And you just say all this to this thing called Amazon Echo. Yep. It don't, won't, doesn't want to have to ask you for payment, won't ask you anything else. And you just tell them when you want it. And anywhere from hour and a half to two days, it'll be at your doorstep. Talk about impulse buying. Hmm? And boy, you can have things just like that. Used to be, uh, I remember talking to a couple of folks who, uh, they, they got in trouble when the uh, uh, shopping channels first came on TV. Remember where you had people who can't sleep at night, they stay up and you know what's on? Uh, buy this and look at this. And, and you know what they're doing? They were buying stuff. And then they were up over their head in debt because they were buying things. Impulse buying. Uh, just uh, take patience. Patience. One of the worst things that's happened to us in our country is credit. Is this on? 
Uh, one of the worst things that's happened to us, our country, is credit. You know why? It used to be you had to save up the money and buy it. And, uh, and you, 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 you purchased it. If you think you want something and you think you could you do it, why don't you, why don't you take a year and put, put aside the payment every month for 12 months and then just buy the thing? See? That's, that's discipline. Patience before buying a car. Patience before getting furnishings for your own appliances, tools, clothing. So he says, you see something you like, you ought, to, you ought to wait 60 days and then ask yourself, do I still want this? There's, there's all kinds of, listen, there's everybody here probably that can go to your, some things in your house and, and pull out a drawer or open a cupboard or look in your garage and say, what did I get that for? Or what is this doing here? Or what is this? Hmm. Sometimes you find something and say, what, what is this? And what did we have this here for? That's why, that's why, hey, we just had a, in our neighborhood, had the yearly big garage sale. You know, everybody puts out their junk and everybody trades their junk once a year, you know. And, uh, and everybody puts their stuff out. It's amazing. What is it? It's just things that we accumulated. And then people look around and say, well, what do, what do we have this for? Let's get rid of this. We don't, we don't need this. And, and uh, I had one fella at the gym where I go <laughs> tell me he's clean out his garage and he was finding stuff never been open. Still in the packaging. It's just stuck in his garage. He got it somewhere sometime and stuck it in there and forgot he ever even bought it. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, but that's probably not that unusual in America. So patience before making a big purchase. Here's some questions to ask yourself, all right? Number one, can I afford this without credit? Can I afford this without credit? Number two, why do I want this? <laughs> Is that a good thing to ask? Why do I want this? How about this? How long will I use this? How long will I use this? I mean, if you just need it one time, get it from Bob Reed. He has everything. <laughs> I'm teasing. I have most of his stuff. No, I don't. But uh, how long will I use this? And then ask yourself, D, uh, do, I, do I have something similar? Do I have something similar? Sometimes we go buy something simply because we can't find the one we had, we thought we had. <laughs> so we end up, then we end up with three or four of them around the house, okay? Some of you are shaking your head. You know what that's about. And then here's one that we don't, we know we haven't learned in America yet. Do I have enough space? You know what we do? We filled our houses up, we filled our garage up, we have to go rent a building somewhere and, and throw stuff in that place in order to keep all the stuff we got. It's unbelievable. And that's from people who said, Do I have do I really have room to get this? Should I get this? And it's all because we don't exercise patience. We don't wait. All right? Number three, when do we need to exercise patience? We need to exercise patience when disciplining our children. Disciplining our children. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Most of you know verse 1. What's Ephesians 6, 1? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for they're always right. No, it doesn't, doesn't say that. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Okay, but then, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now the instruction to fathers, and I think to mothers as well, but it says, and ye fathers, notice, provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now the Bible makes it clear that if a parent loves their child, then they will correct them when they're out of line. A loving parent will guide and teach their children. The truth is, the Bible says if you do not train and teach your child, and by the way, if you don't correct your child, the Bible says you don't love your child. Don't, don't ever say, well, I love my child too much to ever spank him, or I love my child too much to ever correct him. 
No, the Bible says you don't love them at all. That's what God says. God says if you love them, you'll have to correct them. In fact, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that God chastens every son whom he receives. So God has disciplined each one of us. You know why? He loves us. And so if we love our children, we have to discipline them. We have to correct them. And it's loving to discipline the child. That's pretty, pretty powerful words here for parents. When we discipline our children, we give them hope. Someone's going to get disciplined right now. <laughs> we give them hope. We help them make good decisions. And we help them live a long and peaceable life. The best, the best book on child rearing is the book of Proverbs. There's, there's incredible amount of wisdom and instruction on rearing children in the book of Proverbs. And the example, again, the example we have is God's discipline of us. All right? And God doesn't, you know, I understand. How many of you when younger, when your parents disciplined you or they spanked you, you had a dad or a mom who said, now this hurts me more than it hurts you. How many of you heard that, those words? Yeah, most of you saying. How many as a kid didn't believe that? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> now that you're a parent, how many of you believe that? Yeah, you better believe that. Sure does. No, no parent. If you're, if you're a parent that enjoys disciplining or giving your child a spanking, then you have problems. You got issues, okay? And you need some help. And we'll hopefully help you with that. But you understand, it's, it's not an enjoyable thing, but it is a necessary thing. And God does not enjoy it when he has to discipline us. But he does it because he loves us. Notice, in fact, look, look at Hebrews 12. Would you turn there with me? This is where we understand what the, what the good results of discipline, discipline are. Notice, God says in verse number 9, Furthermore, we have had, this is Hebrews 12, verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. You know why your kids don't give you respect? Because you don't correct them. Okay? What do, you, what do you, if you're not there to correct them, mom and dad, what are you there for? If they're just there to do whatever they want to do, what are you there for? Okay? If children are to obey their parents, doesn't that mean you should give them something to obey? I mean, that just makes sense to me. All right? Look, we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, that's our earthly fathers, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Okay? Sometimes uh, he's saying your earthly parents will, will chasten you or discipline you because they want, it, it's for their pleasure. In other words, listen, no kid of mine is going to act that way. It's not, it's really not motive, they're not right motive to discipline your child because they embarrassed you, okay? That's not the right motive. That's discipline for your pleasure because you want your kid to be a certain way, okay? Notice what he said about God. But he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, verse 11, truer words were never spoken. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. There's no child yet that ever received a proper spanking that said, boy, is this enjoyable. <laughs> okay? No, it's grievous. It ought to be grievous. Okay? Nevertheless, nevertheless, what happens after you get the, 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 the chastening, after you get the spanking? What happens? It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. You get that by discipline. Now, there's a proper way to discipline. Disciplining in anger will bring anger from the child. 
you cannot discipline in anger. Too often spanking a child has become an adult throwing a temper tantrum and taking it out on the child. You know what it is? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an adult saying, come here, come here. You're not going to behave that way. That's not a spanking. That's you throwing a temper tantrum and taking it out on your kid. Okay? That's not Bible discipline. Okay? That's you in anger lashing out at your kid. Then you wonder when your child gets angry why he lashes out. Because you taught him to do that. See? You're provoking your child to anger. Okay? You all right? Some of you are looking at me. I'm, I'm just... Don't spank your child when you're angry, mad, or frustrated. Now, why do I say that? Because children can make you angry, mad, and frustrated. Okay? That's just... It's in their genes, and it was in yours too. That's why when your child does something, then you have to discipline them. You send them to their room to wait for you. Or you sit them in a chair to wait for you. Why? So you can cool down. So you can be under control. So you can think about what you're doing. Not just for them to think about what they've done. But it's for you so you don't discipline them in anger. You're deciding whether what they've done is a spanking offense or not. You're deciding how severe it needs to be, how, what the discipline should be or what the punishment should be. And you're going to be calm enough to do it in love and not in frustration and anger. You come in and you talk to the child and you explain to them what they've done. If they're old enough, I ask them what they've done. And, and listen, what, what, you, what the wise parent does is you, you, you make sure that you lay down what the, what the offenses are and what the punishment is for those offenses. So they know. Listen, something can't be funny one day and they get a spanking for it another day. Depending on how you feel. Okay? If it's wrong, it's wrong. If, it's, if you're going to do this wrong, this is what's going to happen. And they have to know their boundaries. They have to know what is right and what they're going to get punished for. And when they know that, here's what I did. And if you do that, what is our punishment? And it may be a spanking. It may be time out. Maybe whatever you've decided, whatever you've laid down. But then you say, well, then we have to take care of that. We have to enforce that. And, and then you enforce it. Now, if it's a, if it's a spanking offense, we always, you, ought, you ought to have something that you use a wooden spoon, a, something, a, a rule, something that'll sting a little bit, but I don't think you ought to use your hand. And you ought to apply it to where God gave them the padding. They used to say that you applied the board of education to the seat of learning. Okay? And, and God gave everybody extra padding in a certain area of their anatomy. Some of us more than others. But it is there for a purpose, okay? And that is the target area, okay? And you're not doing it in anger. You're not doing it because you're mad. You're not taking out. You're calmly administering the discipline, okay? That is the punishment. They know it's the punishment, all right? And you administer that. When that's done, then you always take the child and you hold them. If they're older, you just set them beside you. I usually put the kids, they're young enough. Once your kids get a certain age, the spanking days will be over. Seriously. You won't have to do that. And, and, and when they get to be uh, old enough, the truth is there's other ways to inflict pain on them better than spanking. When I got to be a certain age, I'd rather my dad give me a spanking. You know why? A few minutes over with and I can go do what I want. But when he said, I don't go out for the next two weekends, whew, I didn't like that. See, that hurt worse than just, just give, me the, give me the spanking. All right? So, yeah, but you know what? You, you hold them, and again, you assure them, I love you. I love you. 
boy, I don't like giving a spanking. Please obey. Do the right thing so I don't have to do that. I don't think you like it either, do you? No. Now, if they sin against me or they sin against their mom, they need to ask forgiveness. But they also sin against God. And so we always pray. And we ask God to forgive them. I have them pray and ask God to forgive them. Okay? If they need wrong, they need to call. We have to call mom in and they have to ask forgiveness from mom for disobeying mom. And we pray and we ask God to forgive us. And once that's done, then it's done. Okay? And then, then you hug them, you kiss them, you tickle them, you do something to let them know, you know what? Everything's okay. Everything's all right. Everything's back. Our, our, our fellowship is good and we don't hold that. That's, that's over with and we're ready to move on. Okay? And, and that's patience when you're giving discipline to your children. Okay? Always have patience. All right? Follow that guideline. Okay? Number four. You doing all right? You having patience with the lesson on patience? Number four. Back to the book of Proverbs. Have patience, number four, when answering someone. Wow. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Notice with me verse number eight. Proverbs 25, verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. And then Proverbs 29 and verse 20, where the, where the Bible says this, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There's more hope of a fool than of him. You know what? Once a word is spoken, you can never bring it back. You ever, you ever had one? Ever had some words come out and you wish you could grab them and bring them back in? But they're out there. You can't do it. So what do you do? Wait before you answer. Wait before you answer. You can say, I'm sorry. You can say, please forgive me. But it doesn't bring the words back. You know, it's, it's like the old illustration of taking a board and pounding nails in it. And then you can say, well, I'm sorry, and pull all those nails out. But what's still in the wood? All those holes are still there. And you can say you're sorry, but the words go down. They're like the wounds of a, an arrow. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Every one of you, there's many of you in this room, you fight words that have been said to you that are still wounding you and have wounded you deeply even though the person has said they're sorry and they wish they hadn't said them but that doesn't heal the wound up wound's still there so be cautious be patient before you answer rather than have to say I take back what I said it's much better to say let me think about that. Let me think about that. Wait before giving your opinion. I'll say more about that in a minute. Be patient. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay? Listen carefully. Two ears one mouth. Okay? Listen twice as much as what you want to say. Okay? So when answering again, have patience. Number five. Number five. You, you want to exercise patience when wanting to criticize people. Look at Proverbs 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Verse number 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. It's so easy to get hasty and criticize people. People, people wrong you, or people, people are critical of you, and it's so easy to fire right back. It's so easy to come right back at him and say, yeah, well, how about this? 
That's where that saying comes where hurting people hurt people. You hurt me, buddy, I'll hurt you worse. Husbands and wives are real good at this. Well, he knows how to push my buttons. Means he knows how to hurt me. And guess what? You know how to hurt him. Children, teenagers, know how to hurt mom and dad. Mom and dad know how to hurt teenagers. And it's so easy to get be criticism for criticism. It's, it's difficult. And you really have to ask God to help you. And, it, and by the way, it, it's something that uh, pastors have to work on. Because people, you know, uh, there's times people get upset. I know you won't believe this, but people get upset with the pastor. <laughs> no, seriously. And, and sometimes they get upset and leave the church. Because they don't agree with the pastor. And, and the, 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 I, I would say the easy thing to do is to get up. If, if let's say Quentin got mad and he left the church. And whatever the issue is that Quentin had, you know, then, then the easy thing to do is for me to get up next Sunday morning and preach a whole sermon about what he and I had a disagreement about. And I just roast him to death. You, you, I may not mention him by name, but you know who I'm talking about. By the way, I've been places where that happens. Don't, and you know what the pastor said? That, that's wrong. That's wrong to do. And so uh, you have to ask God, and I've asked God many times, give me patience. I, I don't want to get bitter. I don't want to feel wounded. Sometimes your preachers talk about a backdoor revival. What they mean is, oh, they're glad some people left. We shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be that way. Uh, patience. I wonder, I wonder how many church splits. I wonder how many church battles. I wonder how many church fights could have been avoided if people just would have been patient and waited. Hmm? Can I help you with something? If there's a disagreement between two people, I don't have to have an opinion about it. I know, that's hard in our day and age because they want you to have an opinion about everything. Well, what do you think about what, what happened over here? And what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? After every sports game, people, they'll call in for two hours after the game saying, do you think the manager should have done this? Do you think that guy should have made this play? Do you think he should have done this in this situation? And everybody wants to have an opinion. The most difficult thing you ever do is when, if, if there's a disagreement going on between Jeff Burns and, you know, uh, Bob Reed and, and somebody says, what do you think about that? You know what? I don't have to think anything about that. That's between them. I don't need an opinion on it. I don't have to have an opinion on it. It has nothing to do with me. If, and if someone comes to you and says, well, hey, what do you think about this? You say, you know what? I'm not part of the problem and I'm not part of the solution, so I don't have any opinion on it. Why? You know, the Bible says when you get a hold of something that is none of your business, it's like grabbing a dog by the ears. You don't want to do that. Okay? You go out and find the first pit bull tonight and just go up and grab it by the ears and see how that works out for you. We stumble into the judgment seat so quickly. And when I say don't form an opinion, I, I mean this also. Listen, it's not just that we verbally won't say something. Don't form one up here either. In other words, we think, well, as long as I think it but don't say it, then it's okay. Is that right? Hmm? Look, at, uh, look at Luke chapter 5 with me, will you? Are you doing all right? Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Notice verse number 17. It came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that's Jesus, 
that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law. What are they doing? Sitting by. Just sitting there. They come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And the old man brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy. And they sought means to bring him in to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up upon, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees. Now what were they doing again? Sitting by. Mm -hmm. Begin to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, their reasoning, they're not saying this out loud. They're reasoning in their mind. These are the thoughts that they're having. How do I know that? Look at verse 22. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, What reason ye in your hearts? They think, well, it, it won't hurt anybody because I didn't say it out loud. I'm just thinking it in my mind. Then who's, who is witness to what you're thinking in your mind? Jesus is. God knows. David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Because he sees. He knows. Well, I'm just thinking to myself. No, you're not. You're thinking to yourself and God. Remember Philippians 4.8? Things that are true and lovely and honest and just and good report. If there be any virtue and be any praise, think on these things. Why? You're not the only one who's seeing your thoughts. God is too. They didn't hop up and condemn Jesus. They weren't gossiping or heckling Jesus. They were just thinking to themselves. And Jesus knew their thoughts. They were, they were privately condemning what was going on. Privately sitting in judgment at what was going on, though they didn't verbally say anything. And Jesus still rebuked them for it. Our most secretive judgments of other people have an audience. Jesus Christ himself. So instead of criticizing others or labeling others, when they may be struggling or hurting, we don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, what, 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 what should you do if you're not going to form an opinion? How about pray for them? How about pray for them? Rather than pick at them. And talk about them. Or quietly form some judgment about them. Pray for them. Just ask God to help them. You know, Job... God turned the captivity of Job, Job 42. God turned the captivity of Job. Look there, Job 42. Would you look at that with me? Job 42, right before Psalms. We're almost done. Have patience. Job 42. Verse number 10. A great verse. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. He didn't pray about his friends. He prayed for his friends. By the way, he hadn't thought real good about his friends. Miserable comforters are you all. Okay? You're, 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 you're lousy. He didn't care for him. You know what turned it around? When he started praying for them. Okay? So have patience before you become critical of somebody else. And then lastly, number six, 
Uh, have patience when you begin a new ministry. Have patience when you begin a new ministry. Ecclesiastes 5 talks about keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God for God's in heaven and thou upon earth therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. You know, when we, we, we started a church years ago, and I, I waited two years before we started a bus ministry. And when we started the bus ministry, I drove the bus. Back in those days, you didn't have to have a CDL. Just anybody had a pulse, you could drive a bus, you know. And uh, you, 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 just, you just wait. Sometimes people come and say, Oh, God, I have this ministry. And hey, why don't we do this? And why don't we have that ministry? And, and you know what you oftentimes do? You wait. You're wise to wait. You know why? You have patience. Because... Uh, Time goes by and nobody ever says another word about it. It wasn't the right time to have that ministry. Make sense? Understand? When we want to have the RU ministry, most of you know we waited. We, uh, I've been here 12 years. The, this will be the sixth anniversary of RU. We waited six years. I had a guy come to talk to me about RU not long after I was here, I think it was like 2007, Brother Weber came from up at uh, State Line Baptist Church up in uh, Temperance State up north, right across the border. And he came to talk about it, but it wasn't the right time. We had to have patience, you see, patience. We waited, and the start came, as most of you know the story, with Kirk Williams footing the bill for us. Jesus, Jesus ascended to heaven. And, and he... He, he, he told them that they're going to be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But before that happened, he told them to tarry in Jerusalem till they were endued with power from on high. How long did they tarry, church? How long did they tarry? Hello? Nobody knows? How long did they wait in Jerusalem when the time they watched Jesus go up to heaven till they were endued with power? No? Ten days. 120 of them in the upper room. Ten days. Ten days until Pentecost and the power of the Spirit came and filled them. Ten days. Do you think? I wonder, after five days, if anybody said, man, what are we doing? Should have happened by now. I mean, how, how, how many of us would wait ten days for something? Hard of us, some of us hard to wait ten minutes for something. They waited for 10 days. Then they were endued with power. Then they preached the gospel. Then 3,000 people were saved and baptized. But they had to have patience, waiting for the promise of the Father. Jesus says, I'm, I've gone to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Man, John closed the Bible with saying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I told you the other night, I can't believe we're in 2017. I never thought I'd live to see this day. You wouldn't have convinced me. I'd have said, we'll be in heaven by 2017. Well, here we are. So what do you need? Patience. Be patient under the coming of the Lord. You have to exercise patience. So we exercise patience. Until God makes it clear what it is we're to do. And then listen carefully now. Once God makes it known, once he makes it clear, then do it. Act on it. Move. But don't do anything 
until you know it's clear what he wants you to do. So we need patience when there's a decision to make. Patience before a big purchase. Patience when disciplining a child. Patience when answering somebody. Patience before we criticize somebody else. And patience before beginning a new ministry in a church. Be patient. Can you say that with me? Be patient. One more time. Be patient. Let's be patient. It's a great, great virtue. Let's exercise that in our life, okay? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention. Thank you, Lord, for their patience as we studied this important truth tonight. Something that all of us need. Something the Lord in, in our culture, in the country that we live in and we've most of us have grown up in, it is not too American to be patient but it is Christian. And help us to be Christian. Help develop this virtue in our life, Lord. That we, through faith and patience, might inherit the promises. And help us to exercise patience in these areas that we've discussed this evening. Now dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. May others see Jesus in us this week. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. 128 in the book if you need to look at it. Let's sing it together. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir practice right away.